Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors, episode 73, and the third instalment of our All Things Berlin series. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and it's wonderful to have your company. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast, and thank all of my listeners who've taken the time to rate and review the show. If you'd like to support the work I do, I invite you to become a Talking Tudors patron. It's easy to do. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. In keeping with our Berlin theme this month, May's prize is Anne Boleyn's most happy portrait pendant in bronze, made by the ever-talented Lucy Churchill. Lucy's reconstruction of Anne's portrait medal, which is the only contemporary likeness of the Queen to survive, is based on extensive research and it's truly exquisite. Thank you to Lucy for sponsoring this incredible prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about the Berlins and Hever Castle is Dr. Owen Emerson. Dr. Emerson is a social and cultural historian and was awarded his PhD from the University of Sussex. He's currently working at Hever Castle and is co-authoring a history of Hever with the historian Claire Ridgway. The book will be published as Hever, A Castle and Its People. My conversation with Owen straight after this musical break, courtesy of singer-songwriter Carleen. The song Born to Be Your Queen is from the Ballad of Anne Boleyn, Carleen's best-selling album inspired by the life of Henry VIII's second queen consort. And back to talking to you, Owen, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad, like the rest of us, I think, at the moment, in our strange times. (laughs) Very strange times indeed. (laughs) <laughs> now, Owen, thank you so much for joining us on this series of episodes for the All Things Berlin special that um, I'm currently hosting on the podcast. Absolutely. I thought that, yeah, I thought perhaps um, it's been a little while since you and I last spoke on the podcast and we've had a lot of new people find us, which is wonderful. So perhaps we could start by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me back, uh, Natalie. It's uh, an absolute honour. So I'm an historian working at the stunning Hever Castle, which is located in Kent. Uh, Hever is, of course, most famous for being Anne Boleyn's childhood home. And it's an absolute privilege to work in a place so closely associated with the Boleyn family. Uh, I'm currently writing a book on the long and fascinating history of Hever Castle with the fantastic historian Claire Ridgway. We're looking at the many people who both owned and lived at Teva and sort of in doing so tracing their impact on the building sort of looking at Hiva inside out as it were through its social history so yeah that's that's what I'm up to at the moment that sounds fantastic and I know there's lots of people eagerly awaiting that book oh and so you're going to get working <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's dive straight in Anne Boleyn is often I think, in my opinion, misremembered as someone of a kind of humble birth, but hers is not the rags to riches story it's sometimes made out to be. So could you tell us about Anne's grandparents and her great grandparents and a little bit about the family origin? Yeah, absolutely. There's there seems to be this myth that um, you know, originated from humble birth. And and firstly, I think there are a number of reasons that that legend is perpetuated. Firstly, I think it's accentuated because Anne wasn't herself from a royal family, and so it's become easy to see her story as a more rags to riches one because of her 
elevation to power. And I think this is also heightened because she was in service to a duchess and three queens before her own elevation to queen consort. And I think it's easily forgotten that the positions that she held in these households were reserved for women of incredibly high status. Uh, Being of a maid of honour was just that, an honour bestowed on women of high status. I think a third reason that this rags to riches story lingers is the sort of long lasting myth that Anne's father, Thomas Boleyn, was essentially pimping his daughters out to better himself. And uh, this myth of Thomas being a sort of Machiavellian and ruthless father has thankfully been revised by Claire Ridgway and more recently Dr Lauren McKay in her fabulous study of Thomas and George. Now Thomas was far from being some lowly courtier on the grab as it were. Um, His parents and grandparents had amassed great power and fortune before Henry VIII so much as set eyes on the Blinn daughters. And I, I do actually think there's a tendency to focus on only Anne's male ancestors without acknowledging that Anne's female ancestors were from incredibly powerful families. Now, Thomas's grandfather on his father's side was Sir Geoffrey Boleyn, born around 1406. And after a distinguished career in the Mercer's Company in London, he serves as Sheriff of London in uh, 1445. He serves as an MP and an alderman. And after serving as Lord Mayor of London between 1457 and 58, he was knighted by Henry VI. Now, Geoffrey amassed a huge fortune and made a very advantageous marriage to Anne Hu, born around 1421, who was the daughter of Baron Hu and Hastings. They had two sons and five daughters, and of those who survived, all of them made incredibly good marriages. Geoffrey amassed a great portfolio of properties, purchasing Blickling Hall in Norfolk for, from Sir John Fastolf. And then as part of a syndicate with his brothers and some other partners, Hever Castle in Kent. Now, the Hever estate was enormous and eventually Geoffrey buys this out, uh, estate outright, as it were. Thomas Boleyn's father was Sir William Boleyn, born probably at Blickling in 1451. And like his father, he's also honoured by the king, this time Richard III, who made him a Knight of the Bath. Uh, He then goes on to serve Henry VII as uh, High Sheriff of Kent in 1489, and then Sheriff of Norfolk and Suffolk in 1500. Now, he too makes an incredibly advantageous marriage to Lady Margaret Butler, who was the daughter and co-heiress of Thomas Butler, who was the seventh Earl of Ormond, and his wife was Joan de Beecham. Now, the Butlers are an incredibly old and esteemed part of the Irish nobility, who famously sat at Kilkenny Castle. So Anne's heritage is already looking really rather auspicious uh, before we get to her father's marriage. Sir William and Lady Margaret had 10 children. And again, of those who survived until marriageable age, all of them made incredibly advantageous marriages and none more so than their eldest son, Thomas, born at around 1477, who marries Lady Elizabeth Howard, daughter of Thomas Howard, the second Duke of Norfolk and Elizabeth. Tilney. The Tilneys are an incredibly auspicious and noble family in Norfolk and the Howards are arguably one of the most powerful families in England, although they had fought on the wrong side, as it were, between the Battle of Richard and York and Henry VII. It's clear that Thomas Boleyn was a rising star in the court of Henry VII. He helped to escort, for example, Henry VII's daughter, Margaret Tudor, to Scotland in 1503. And Henry even stays with Thomas at Blickling in 1498, suggesting that at this time Thomas has taken up residence in sort of the chief principal manner of the Boleyns. Um, For example, we believe that at this stage, his father and Margaret Butler, who claim to have a claim to Rochford Hall in Essex as part of the Butler estate, uh, have, have moved down there to allow Thomas to take up residence. Thomas himself is then created Knight of the Bath by Henry VIII and serves him faithfully as an ambassador and diplomat to the Low Countries in France. Thomas has already amassed a huge huge amount of wealth, property and power before his five children are born. So it really begs the question, was he ambitious? And yes, absolutely. But that was absolutely expected of the men at court. Indeed, I would 
kind of argue that ambition was its very heartbeat. So Anne was an incredibly privileged young lady who was always expected to marry well, though not quite as well as she eventually did. So, you know, as the incredibly talented historian Gareth Russell recently put it, Anne was definitely one of the 1%. (laughs) <laughs> yes, and there's lots that stands out to me there that you've said so much fantastic information um, in, in all those comments that you've just made. I suppose what stands out straight away is Anne's illustrious ancestry, firstly. Secondly, I want to talk more about this connection with Norfolk. You've mentioned it a few times. You mentioned the Berlin home, Blickling Hall in Norfolk, and they did have a strong connection to that area. Could you talk to us about this important association? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So the Berlins are probably better known for their connection to Kent because of that whirlwind courtship that it is believed to have taken place between Anne and Henry. But the Berlins actually have a much stronger connection with Norfolk. Indeed, most sources suggest that Anne herself is born in Norfolk at the family home of Blickling Manor. Now, the family connection to Norfolk well predates their connection to Kent and even outlasts that connection too. We have records, for example, of a John Boleyn from 1283 at Saul Church, where you can still visit today. And it and other com- uh, churches around that part of Norfolk are absolutely packed full of Boleyns. There's there's quite literally generations of Boleyns at, you know, in Norfolk. So, you know, if you're a Boleyn fan, you really need to visit there. And that's one of my uh, pieces of advice for Boleyn fans. I would say the most famous connection to Norfolk is... Uh, Blickling Manor, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, it's a gorgeous manor in and of itself today, now owned by the National Trust. Sadly, it, this isn't the house that Geoffrey purchased from Sir John Fastolf, the, st- the stunning house of fair brick. Uh, that is a patterned brick that we know has now sadly long since gone. Uh, indeed, the manor that survived was actually built on that site. And I would still strongly advise people to visit the house, though it's you know, quite literally standing where the Berlins lived all those years ago. They had a whole litany of Norfolk properties, the Berlins. Um, They even had a property in Norwich in King Street, which still survives. It's speculated, for example, that this was once an inn uh, for which the Berlins gleaned further income. So I would argue that Norfolk is really the family seat of the Berlins, as it were. And and of course, it's this connection that enables this advantageous marriage of Thomas to Elizabeth Howard, who is indeed a Norfolk lady. Yeah, and definitely. And I agree with you about Blickling Hall, as you know, we refer to it now, that even though the house that they knew is no longer there, there is, if there can be a sense of the Berlin somewhere apart from Heber, I think there's quite a strong Berlin kind of vibe happening at Blickling. And Very of course, there's, so, the, yeah. there's the church there as well, where there's lots of interesting connections for you to see. And you mentioned Norwich as well. There's Norwich Cathedral. So I'm totally with you. I think a pilgrimage to the north is um is, should be on the list of every every Berlin fan have listening at the moment. Yes. Now, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit now about Hever Castle, where you are very lucky to to work, which is incredible. Uh, you mentioned that this was a vast estate that Thomas Boleyn inherited after his father died. His father died in 1505. And he sort of said about, because it was a medieval castle, but Thomas, as you've mentioned, was a rising star at court and, of course, needed a home fit for a prominent courtier. So, Oh, and transport us back to the Berlin family home. If we were visiting the family in the early 16th century, what would we have seen and experienced? So this is a fantastic question and thankfully one that I've been given a lot of thought to when writing our book. And so I'm going to take you uh, back in time to the era of the Blins uh, when they were living at Teva. And I'm going to give you a little audio tour of the castle as it would have been all those years ago. Now, this may well be easier to understand for people who've already visited but I'll try and be as descriptive as possible for those who haven't. And actually, you can go online and do a virtual tour of Heva. So you might want to do it in tandem with what I'm going to say. So we're going to arrive at the castle via the Church of St. Peter, which is just up the hill from the castle. Now, one big difference between then and now is that the public road would have originally taken us much, much closer to the castle than it does today. This road was moved much to the chagrin of the local populace by William Wardorf Astor in the 1900s to provide his estate with more privacy. So originally the road would have taken us down to where 
Now, the shop and cafe are now located to the west of the castle. So the castle itself would have been very visible to those using the public highway. Now, the path to the castle uh, that now exists, that's lined by beautiful topiary, wasn't so during the Boleyn's tenure. And actually, this is here where the first line of the castle defences was located, the guardhouse, sadly now long gone. Uh, it was a, a couple of small one storey stone buildings where the guard would have inquired as to what we were doing here at Hever today. Uh, but thankfully for us, Natalie and listeners, we are valued guests of the Berlins. <laughs> so we're going to be allowed to progress to the castle. The castle is double moated as it is today. But unlike today, the outer moat actually feeds into a large large pond which is located to the southwest of the castle and another significant difference is that there is no inner walkway uh, with a beautifully planted grass border which abuts to the castle today and the castle walls actually drop straight down into the inner moat for obvious defensive purposes and also you'll notice that the castle walls are painted a very vivid, bright white colour with a whitewash, not as the exterior is today with the natural sandstone colour. You'll also notice that are many more buildings, predominantly farm-based structures around the castle that no longer exist. Uh, the largest of these is a beautiful Tudor stables, which sit to the southwest of the castle. Now, this was a double storey complex with vast stables below, a staircase up to the second floor with a beautiful open gallery that leads to five bed chambers and a 30 foot vaulted chamber where the groomsmen and their families would have lived. Uh, it's a real tragedy, but this beautiful structure was demolished by Captain Guy Seabright, who rented Heaver during the Victorian era. Uh, it's one of our great losses. Uh, now, we're going to head over the castle drawbridge, which, unlike today, has a stone beginning to it, which leads onto a wooden drawbridge, which, of course, can be hauled up should the castle be invaded. There is some very uh, decorative machicolations above our head, which are sort of ornamental openings at the top of the keep from which arrows and detritus can be propelled again on invading people. Uh, in the gatehouse, there are three portcullises, unlike the two that we have today. And you would most certainly recognise both the lattice gates that are still there and the great doors with the wicked gate for easier access. And of course, above our heads, as we go through the gatehouse are murder holes, which again can be used for firing arrows and dropping detritus should anyone get through that portcullis. As we enter the courtyard, one major difference is there is no third floor. Uh, the Berlins only had two floors to their house, so there are no quaint little gables on the top of the wooden house. These are a much later addition. You'll also notice that there are four doors to the house. For this is a functioning courtyard. Indeed, there are two paved pathways that cross in the middle that leads to these separate doors. Now, there's a doorway to the right hand side, which leads into a tiled area. Uh, now, this is the beautifully panelled drawing room today. But going back in time, we're actually in a uh, larder, essentially, with a dairy to the right hand side. And if we were to carry on to the north of this passageway, we would reach the Great Kitchens, which is now the beautiful inner hall. This originally would have had two massive fireplaces. Of course, it's a massively high space. Uh, that's to create more air in there because this would have been a very uh, hot place to work. Of course, there's no beautiful Italianate walnut in here as there is today uh, on the walls. It's just plain plaster walls for added light. Indeed, this whole east wing of the house that we're in is solely for the reserve of the household. If we go back out into the courtyard and through the door opposite to the west wing of the house, we'll find ourselves in the Chatelaine's office. Now, this downstairs space in the West Wing is where essentially the business of the household is completed. Now, there's no direct access here to the family part of the castle. This is, as all Tudor houses of this stature would have been, a household with very clearly defined class divisions. So we're going to head back out of this door as we're valued guests of the Berlins today, and we're going to go back out into the courtyard and enter 
the door on the north wing of the house. Now, this is where visitors today would enter. Now, as we enter this door, there's uh, two major differences. To the left hand side, you would see a massive staircase which winds round in a U shape. This is sadly long gone. And this entrance hall has really been added on by the Boleyns to enclose the great hall, really for added comfort, which lays beyond. Now, ahead of us is the original uh, medieval doorway, which you can still see today. And another big difference is there's no way of getting into the kitchens to the right. This is blocked off. Again, this is a house well divided so that the family and their guests are spared the smells and sights of labour. Now, as we head through that medieval archway, we turn left into the Great Hall. If we were here 100 years earlier, this hall would have been much uh, higher with a vaulted beamed roof and a central hearth. But Thomas Boleyn is a, a, a gentleman of status and he's enclosed the roof for added warmth uh, with the advent of a side fireplace. Uh, the Great Hall would originally have been uh, much greater as well, much longer, and it would have abutted to the uh, outer curtain wall. But what the Boleyns have done is portioned off a parlour at the west end of the hall, divided with a wooden screen. Now, this is still there today. But to get to the parlour, there was a doorway which would have been to the right of that oak panelling. Now, at the top of that wooden screen would have actually been a small peep window looking down into the Great Hall from the upper floor solar. This space wouldn't have actually been frequented by the Berlins all that much. Uh, they would probably dine here when large parties visited, but the, when the family's honoured guests would join them, they would take them upstairs to, the par uh, to their solar. So as it's just us and the Berlins today, we're going to head through that small door to the right hand side of the screen and into the parlour. The parlour is now today known as the morning room. Uh, but this space would rarely have been used in the morning as it gets very little light until the afternoon. What this space is for is really uh, it acts as a status symbol in the Tudor era. Of course, in a highly patriarchal society. And this space tells us visitors that Thomas is a wealthy gentleman and that his women folk can sit and talk or parley and they don't need to work. Uh, so this is really a, a sort of a female dominated space which also tells us a lot about the man of the house. We're going to go up to where the Boleyns actually live now uh, which is actually a very small part of the castle in comparison to the whole footfall as it were. Uh, so we're going to head up the spiral staircase which still exists today and we're going to visit the Boleyns private sanctum. The upper floor suite of rooms is really essentially the sum total of the Boleyns private space in the house. It is the Boleyns solar or great chamber and the first room now known as Anne Boleyn's bedroom is really a small antechamber to that great chamber and it's here that that little peep window looking down into the great hall is situated. This is a really handy feature so that the family can spy on what the servants are basically up to downstairs. There's also a beautiful oriel window which is still there today, it feeds up from the parlour into this space. We're going to head through this room into the next room, now known as the Book of Hours room, and we really do find ourselves in the heart of the Boleyns family home here. This is where all of the children likely would have slept, this is where they were educated, and where the family will dine privately. This is an incredibly fluid space where trestle tables are erected and removed as required. So if you want to get up and close to the Blim family, then this is the room you need to be in. This really is the centre of their world. Beyond the great chamber is the best bedroom. Now, this is likely where Thomas and Elizabeth would have slept. This is now known as the Queen's Chamber today. And this room actually also does have an antechamber located in the castle keep which isn't actually open to the public. Indeed, it's now a very pink bathroom. Um, here are also located some very steep stairs to the other two rooms in the keep, uh, now known as the council chamber. And above it is, again, a room that's closed off to the public. Now, this is where the family would have lived during the medieval era. And this is also where the mechanisms for those three portcullises and the drawbridge are located. If we head down the long spiral staircase which again visitors go down today we exit through the fourth and final door to the courtyard 
you may well be surprised at actually how small that living space is where the Berlins live. But this kind of close living was really advantageous and desirous in the Tudor era. Privacy is something that marked Tudor living out from earlier eras. And it, it's really considered a, a symbol of Thomas's wealth to contain his family in a much more private space than uh, his ancestors would have uh, lived in. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of what the Blins house was actually like uh, during their, their tenure there. Absolutely. I just love that. I think I had a, a smile on my face that whole time, just picturing <laughs> myself wandering around. And I think it's really like I just found it fascinating that you talking about how fluid that space was where they lived, because I think today we have this kind of idea that things have to be permanent, like this is my yeah. bedroom and that's your bedroom and this is where we dine. And of course, at that time, especially in the early 16th century, as you say, things were adaptable and fluid and you may have taken a screen down and suddenly you've got a different space. So I found that really, really interesting and really important. So thank you, Owen. It was Not great. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you also, when you, we, we were arriving to the Berlin um, house, you talked a little bit about the outside. And I just want to touch on that a little bit more. Now, when we visit the beautiful Hever Castle, of course, these immaculately manicured gardens <laughs> stand out. And, and, and you said that this is quite different to the grounds that surrounded the Berlin family home. I wonder if you could paint a picture of, of the landscape, the surrounding landscape that the Berlins would have known at that time. Of course. Yeah, you're completely right. There's no maze outside, no cafe or <laughs> fabulous Tudor towers for the children to play in, nor is there a huge lake or a formal Italianate garden. The landscape that you would see is essentially the, the Kentish Weald and what you would overwhelmingly see is oak. Uh, the Weald is famous for its vast swathes of great oak trees. Now, it's because of this high proportion of dense forest that the Weald became an incredibly rich place in the Tudor era for the iron industry, uh, the wood uh, being used as charcoal to power the furnaces. Uh, so there's a huge uh, amount of industry going on starting uh, in the mid-Tudor era uh, in this area because of its landscape. Uh, now, the landscape around Hever would have been incredibly dense with such trees and the immediate area outside the castle would have been populated with the industry of the household. So as I mentioned earlier, there would have been farmhouses, oast houses, paddocks for livestock and all sorts of farm-based activity going on. This was a largely self-sufficient estate and the Berlins would have employed a large retinue of staff to manage that domestic industry. Uh, we know that Thomas has free warren to hunt on his estate so there would have also been a large deer park for the family to hunt in. So to sum up what you'd have looked at, I mean it would have looked dramatically different to the highly manicured and beautiful gardens that Hever now boasts. In terms of garden, uh, the, the sum of it would have been a, a kitchen garden, essentially, uh, somewhere where herbs and uh, such like were grown for both uh, culinary and medicinal purposes. But beyond that, we're really looking at a very dense wooded estate. Uh, unfortunately, it's nothing as, as glamorous as uh, exists today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Now, we know that Anne spent a good deal of her childhood at Hever and that she returned on a number of occasions during her courtship with Henry. Is there any evidence that Anne visited her family's home during her queenship? That's a really good question. You're, you're absolutely correct. Anne uses Hever uh, as sort of a safe haven during those turbulent years of the great matter. And it's clear from Henry's correspondence with her that she's locating herself at Heaver at various times during their courtship. Very interestingly, actually, Dr. David Stark has recently concluded that it's at Heaver that Anne makes the monumental decision to marry Henry uh, during the Christmas celebrations of 1526. Now, this is when she sends that famous little bejeweled ship to Henry oh, to tell yes. her she's going to sort of brave the rough seas with him. And it's to Heaver that Henry writes back to thank her for this important gift and acknowledges its significance. A bit later on, it's again to Heaver that Anne returns when the great sweating sickness uh, returns in 1528, a vicious disease that claims the life of her brother-in-law, William Carey. Uh, Henry actually writes rather frantically to her at Heaver, 
uh, during this time. You can you can almost see the concern in the sort of unusual number of mistakes that he makes in his um, always particularly illegible letters. Uh, <laughs> and he actually sends quite famously his second best doctor to attend her. Did Anne ever visit his queen? So sadly, we just have no evidence that this ever happened, right, um, yeah. although I'd love it to be the case. Um, and of course, does go on progress with Henry during her sort of thousand days as queen consort. Uh, but we just don't have that evidence that she actually came to Eva. But having said that, what I can say is that I believe that we can say that with some certainty that she was there in heart and mind at times particularly towards the end of her life. Uh, for example, we know that her parents retreat to Heva during the dramatic downfall of Anne and George. And we know that when Anne is imprisoned in the tower, uh, she's concerned for the well-being of her mother, Elizabeth, who is reportedly sick at this time. This is noted down by William Kingston. So I think that if you know we can't account for her there in body, I think we can definitely say that she was there in spirit at times during her queenship. So I hope that's not a cop out answer. But, um. <laughs> no, actually, I actually agree with you. I think that was still a retreat, uh, a spiritual retreat for her, yes. even if it wasn't a physical one. But you know what, Owen, I still hold hope that something will turn up to tell us. <laughs> oh, I always say, you Wouldn't know, that she, she popped in for a visit. Let's let's look for that evidence. I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm enjoying that. <laughs> now, you mentioned, of course, that, um, that Elizabeth and Thomas Boleyn retreat to Heva after the tragic deaths of their children, Anne and George. George. Let's talk a little bit more about their parents after this tragic event. What became of Thomas and Elizabeth? Sure. It's a it's a really rather tragic and sad end to the story of the Blins of Heaver, I feel. And their, their fall is really as swift as it is brutal. Uh, Heaver Castle, of course, could no longer claim to be the childhood home of the Queen of England, for Anne's marriage had been annulled just before her execution. Therefore, in law, she'd never been queen at all, nor was her daughter Elizabeth a legitimate claimant to the throne. Heaver had also lost its heir. Uh, the castle, of course, should have become the property of George Boleyn after the deaths of both of his parents, Elizabeth uh, Boleyn, having actually been given a lifetime stake in the castle as part of William Boleyn's dower. I think Heaver undoubtedly would have been a place of huge sorrow and grief in the months after the executions. I'd almost argue that the whistle of the French sword is the death knell for the Boleyns at Heaver. Uh, its most famous family would only retain Heaver for another four years. Now, much judgment has been made of Thomas for his seeming inaction when two of his children were executed. But I feel the question must be asked, what could he have done? So when Queen Catherine, for example, had fallen from favour, she had essentially the protection of, of Spain that ensured her life. Henry could go no further than he did. But Anne is protected by no one. Her husband was the king. He's the supreme head of his church. And realistically, there is simply nothing that Thomas could have done to aid George and Anne in their perilous last days. They've been condemned as traitors by their maternal uncle following an open trial by their peers. I think Thomas essentially does all that he could during May 1536. He pulls up Heber's drawbridge, makes himself small and inconspicuous and hopes to survive those winds that snatched his beloved children. Now, Anne's fears for her mother's well-being prove to be astute, um, for she dies on the 3rd of April 1538, uh, less than two years later, and she's buried at the Howard family crypt in Lambeth, near to where she died. Thomas wasn't cast away in disgrace, as is commonly depicted in popular culture. Uh, although he is replaced as Lord Privy Seal, uh, he does re retain a place at court and he even presides at the christening of Prince Edward in 50, 1537, which must have been incredibly hard for him to do. However, I will say that there is a marked change in the tone of his correspondence that we have that exists from this time, much of which is written to people directly involved in his children's downfall. And I think it's safe to conclude from this correspondence that Thomas is a broken man after his son and daughter 
are so brutally slaughtered. Um, he breathes his last at Hever Castle in March 1539, being buried near his son, Henry, at the Church of St. Peter's at Hever. Henry VIII honours the passing of his former father-in-law by affording masses to be said in his memory. And Thomas actually leaves ample provisions for his mother, Margaret Butler, to live out her last days at Hever. She really is the last of the Boleyns of Hever. The Hever estate passes very briefly to James Boleyn, who sells it to Henry VIII in exchange for some money and also, crucially, properties in Norfolk. This is the Boleyns retreating back to their family seat. Oh, it's such a heartbreaking story, isn't it? It is. It really it's is really, horrible. It doesn't matter how many times I hear it or read about it. I always sort of wish that there was some other way it could end, yes. but it's it's always the same. But um, I did want to mention there, um, you know, in another episode of our All Things Bullying, we'll be discussing Thomas Cromwell's role in all of this. But um, Lord yes. Privy Steele, of course, went to Thomas Cromwell after it did. Um, Thomas. <laughs> so it let's can't just have put been it out an, there and. <laughs> yeah, it can't have been an easy exchange, can it, for Thomas? Oh, it really can't. Me. Goodness. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, you know, the, the Boleyn family are perhaps Heber's most famous residents, but Anne of Cleves also lived at the castle. So yes. when and how did she acquire Heber? And do we know much about her time there? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There are two queens consort who live at Heber, the other Anne of Cleves, who is granted the right to live at Heber from 1540, uh, just after her the annulment from her marriage to Henry, until her death. So for 17 years, she has Hever as a property. Now, contrary to popular belief, Anne of Cleves never actually owned Hever. She is granted the right to rent numerous properties, including the palaces of Richmond, Bletchingley, and of course Hever, and numerous other houses, and the, crane, the crown pays her rent. It's a very awkward little arrangement, but it's an important distinction because it means the properties remain the property of the crown. So therefore, for Anne's tenure at Hever, the castle is actually owned by Henry VIII, Edward VI, Queen Jane for all of 13 days, and then by Queen Mary and King Philip. So it has a really illustrious ownership during Anne's tenure. So Anne actually pays the sum of £9, 13 shillings and three and a half pence per annum to the Court of Augmentation to rent Heather. It appears that Anne spends much of the time after the annulment of her marriage at Bletchingley or Richmond. However, when Henry dies, and Anne sort of drops down in status from being the king's sister to the king's aunt, Edward actually revokes Anne's right to lease these more auspicious uh, residences. And it appears that Anne then spends much more of her time at Hever. We have references to Anne being at Hever when she writes to Mary on the occasion of her marriage. And we also have references to the good quality of Hever honey when she's writing to her brother, which is a lovely little um, anecdote. Oh, that is lovely. Um, yeah. It leads me on to a really lovely little nugget of information we get from Anne from a gentleman called Thomas Carden, who is given Bletchingly uh, by Edward after Anne. Now, it appears that Anne had a habit of just showing up unannounced <laughs> and living at Thomas Carden's expense. As he writes to Edward's Privy Council, asking for additional funds to entertain her. Uh, she's quite a wily character, if you ask me. She's, you know, rather, uh, I'm assuming, rather annoyed that this beloved property has been taken away from her. So she just decides to carry on living at someone else's expense, essentially. <laughs> um and we get this fabulous detail. He complains bitterly that she's taken over the laundry space as her own privy kitchen. We get this wonderful detail that this princess, this former queen, is a, a cook. It's highly <laughs> unusual. That's amazing. Um, and, I, that. you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking if, if Anne is happy to cook in other people's households, then she certainly would have done so in her own. So I really like to think of her in that space, that inner hall, which was the great kitchens, doing some cooking. I think it's a fabulous little uh, insight into her, her character. She's just sort of doing what she wants. She's not sort of confined by the social convention. She's got this large retinue of properties. She's got a really good income. 
and she's having a nice life. I, I think it's a fabulous sort of um, existence. She, out of any of the wives, is most certainly the survivor. So we know also that a, a number of her household are married from Heaver. And when she dies, she actually leaves funds for the port of Heaver in her last will and testament. So I think all this actually indicates that Anne spent far more time at Heaver than historians have previously anticipated. And that also she's very fond of it. I think that comes across in her correspondence and the sort of activities that she gets up to. That's wonderful. I love those little vignettes of her cooking and just yes. rocking up to someone else's house. That is that's, <laughs> that's really great because you get a sense of her character, of course, and and it's quite different to how she is sometimes represented. So that's really wonderful. Totally, love yeah. that. And the honey, <laughs> that's a good one. So I didn't really have good honey at Eva. That's fantastic. Yeah, I still do. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's great. All, all right. So although Thomas Boleyn is the most famous by far of the four sons of Sir William Boleyn and Margaret Butler, the direct line of the male Boleyns didn't actually end with his death. And you've mentioned a couple of the other Boleyns um, in, in your talk today. So at least two of his brothers outlived him, and that was William and James. Could you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, of course. So you're absolutely correct. I've already mentioned that Heaver was briefly passed to James Boleyn, one of Thomas's surviving brothers. Uh, when Thomas dies. So James has a very decent career. He's also knighted in 1520. He sits, for example, in the Reformation Parliament. He serves as Chancellor in the household of his niece, Queen Anne Boleyn. And he's also present at the reception of Anne of Cleves. So his career, you know, survives the downfall. And he also lives to be a really good old age. He sees his niece, Elizabeth I, crowned. And we get lovely detail from his will that he leaves her a number of items, for example, a book, a basin, a gilt cup, when he dies well in his 80s in 1561. And he's buried, it's said, with much pomp uh, at Blickling, at the family home. There has been much dispute about when another of Thomas's brothers, William, died. And it's really <laughs> thanks to your research that this conundrum has finally been settled. Oh, thank so I you, Owen. <laughs> highly recommend your visitors, you know, have a look at the, your articles on The Last Boleyns. They're fascinating. And we know, thanks to your research, that William, who is the Archdeacon of Winchester, dies in 1551. Previously, it was thought he actually outlived uh, James, uh, dying in 1571, but that you very convincingly argued is not correct. Oh, thank you. That was um, a, fun, um, a fun little puzzle. Yes, to solve, <laughs> fascinating. And of course, you know, Thomas's grandchildren, Catherine Carey and Henry Carey by Mary Boleyn, they go on to have distinguished careers at the court of their cousin Elizabeth. So arguably the Boleyns have much longer legs than their name allows uh, and really auspicious ones as well. So true. And I love the fact that James got to see Elizabeth crowned. I think that's yes. such a nice direct link to the family, to her mother. And yeah, that's really wonderful. All right. Now, we, you know, you've mentioned some of those changes that have undergone at Heaver throughout the centuries. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of those later restorations, especially the work done by William Waldorf Astor. Yeah, of course. So there's really a number of periods of restoration and they largely correspond to when people who own Heaver or intend to own it actually live at the castle. So although there are many, many families who own Heaver, actually very few of them live there, choosing instead to rent it out. And this helps to explain actually why we've got so much of the Blinn's house extant. There really is a huge amount of the Blinn's house left for us to enjoy. Now, Jane Waldo made some renovations to the castle in 1830, and then Captain Guy Seabright of the Destroying the Stables fame, he actually removes yes. <laughs> all of her Victorian additions when he rents the castle just before the, fam uh, the Astor family purchase it. Um, of course, the most famous renovations, as you mentioned, came between 1903 and 1908, when the incredibly wealthy uh, gentleman, uh, uh, William Wardolph Astor, purchases Heaver, uh, much to the annoyance of Guy Seabright, who wanted to purchase it himself. And he throws an absolute fortune at restoring it and manicuring the grounds. Now, there's actually something of a myth that Heaver was in a dilapidated state when Asta purchased it. It was a myth that he liked to perpetuate. But actually, Seabright had largely restored Heaver, Heaver's integrity, the integrity of the house, 
in the years before Astner bought it. We have quite a lot of pictorial evidence of this photographic evidence that the house is in an incredibly sound, uh, sort of sound state. And, and really, Astor gilds the lily. So his greatest addition to the castle is a faux Tudor village that sits behind the castle. It looks quite convincingly like a Tudor village with separate dwellings, when in fact this is a large 100-room extension to the castle, adjoined by a bridge at the back. This is a really clever idea of his. Didn't want to ruin the integrity of the castle, and I don't think he has. And it's, it's this extension where the Astor family and their guests stayed. And this is also where he houses his staff and his vast kitchens. Because believe it or not, William Wardolph Astor lives in the castle alone. I find this <laughs> wow. extraordinary, but oh his gosh. immediate family did not want to stay in the castle. Whether or not it's because of its uh, rumoured ghosts, I have no idea. Um, but the area that is now known as the Astor Suite, a set, a set of three rooms, that was William's bedroom. And the rest of the castle was really presented as really a, a, a show home for his guests. Uh, they, they would largely stay in the Astor Wing, as it's now called, the Tudor Village. And they would come and dine with great pomp and ceremony in the castle and have a wonderful tour back in history, largely that he created Now, he spares absolutely no expense when he renovates Heaver. Indeed, he's not far off in today's money, a billion dollars. It's quite an extraordinary investment. He travels the country. He takes inspiration from Tudor and Elizabethan properties across the country. And he employs craftsmen who he only allows to use original techniques to replicate them at Heaver. So he you know, takes, for example, the beautiful um, drawing room that he creates, which we visited earlier. That was the larder and the dairy. Uh, He has no need of laborious downstairs uh, spaces, places of labour. So he creates, you know, really elaborate places of leisure downstairs, which had previously been the reserve of the servants. So the panelling was replicated from that found at Sizer Castle in Cumbria in that room, for instance, and the the kitchens, which actually had long gone by the time Astor purchased it, is beautifully and very intricately panelled with Italianate walnut. So he really uh, creates a very comfortable Edwardian home with all the feeling of the Tudor era. Electric lighting is added throughout the castle, toilets, bathrooms, as with central heating, all of which is cleverly placed behind panelling so as not to ruin the ancient aesthetic. And the bathrooms are all hidden away. You wouldn't know they're there uh, as visitors today. Uh, They're still hidden away from sight. I do have to admit that the renovations aren't to everyone's taste, although I personally think they are really rather stunning. They're an important part of the castle's history. But what actually impresses me so much is that they are largely aesthetic. Astor actually did very little to the integrity of the original Boleyn home. So if you were to remove all of Astor's additions and Anne were to visit us from beyond the grave, she would actually recognise a huge portion of what remains of her house, uh, particularly that great chamber, that solar complex. Astor did very, very little to that area, and that is the heart of the Boleyn's home. And of course, the Great Hall she would recognise very much. It's really only the places that she wouldn't have visited much, the the places of labour, that have dramatically changed that um, uh, wing that was solely the preserve of the servants. And I I really think it's a testament to Astor's obvious love of Anne Boleyn uh, and her story that he leaves so much of it intact. You are really quite literally walking in the footsteps of the Blinns when you visit Heber today. When you ascend that beautiful spiral staircase up into what is now known as Anne Boleyn's bedroom, and perhaps you run your hands over the stone walls, you really are touching that same stonework that the Boleyn children undoubtedly touched. Um, Now, of course, Astor didn't just stop renovating the castle or adding that massive extension. He overhauls the gardens, too. He installs a stunning Italianate garden, filled it with ancient statues, uh, which are just breathtaking. And he has a vast lake dug 
by hand that took 800 men two years to complete. This this is a mammoth undertaking. Um, it wasn't p- particularly popular by the local inhabitants of Hever. Indeed, Hever has actually been open to the public at this point for a, a good chunk of its history. Um, there was a common practice sort of throughout the 18th and 19th century where you would apply to the household and have a good look round uh, places like Hever. And we have lots of um, accounts of people visiting it. Indeed, Queen Victoria herself, when she's Princess Alexandrina, she visits Hever. There's a lovely account of it in her diaries. But Astor is really closing off that opportunity um, to the general public. Indeed, no one can see it anymore. He's moved that road and uh, that really does stick in the throat of a lot of uh, the local populace who love looking at Hever. But I, I you know, I'm sure you'll agree that uh, now it is open to the public again. It it really was worth it. It's an absolutely stunning creation, and he has preserved the house for generations to come. It was. Um, uh, money well spent I would argue yeah definitely it really is like a fairy tale castle isn't <laughs> yes. it from the outside it's just the most perfect perfect thing ever I think yeah so, and I can't believe he lived in there all on his own I know I know oh, I, I, it's, I, I you know spend a lot of my time in there but I can't say that I'd be happy to sleep in there on my own when I'm when I'm locking up <laughs> no. in my own uh, I have a radio with me and that you know keeps him company uh, I hate to think of sleeping in there on my own. No. Gosh, I'd love <laughs> to know what he what he heard and what he saw in that time. Right. Did he keep a diary? I need to. Do you know, he was a discover. great um, fan of the occult. Um, yes. We know yeah. he's very much into that side of things. So yeah, I'm sure he um, and he was a great storyteller as well. He published a, a number of these fantasy stories of Anne Boleyn's ghost and finding all these treasured oh, okay. uh, documents. In fact, he actually sacks one of his editors because. Um, the editor doesn't think they're very good um, and uh, in order to get them published he sacks his editor uh, which is a lovely um, sort of uh, insight into how quirky he really was. <laughs> I'll have to look some of those up they sound really oh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> they really are yeah they really are. Apart from being just a magnificent place and, and obviously as you say when you're there you're walking in the footsteps of of Anne, of George, Mary, all of them. It's also home to some pretty incredible Tudor treasures. It so is. could you, Owen, tell us about <laughs> some of these, please? Yeah, um, and another thing that Astor lavishes money on is paintings and artefacts. Yeah. And indeed, our current owners, the Guthrie family, have uh, outdone him, really. They've amassed an incredible uh, collection of Tudor portraiture, second only to the National Portrait Gallery, according to David Starkey. Now that of course is is closed thinking about it for the next couple of years so when Hever reopens after this rather nasty lockdown you must all come to Hever to get your fix of contemporary Tudor portraiture. We of course have four paintings of the lady herself Anne Boleyn including the famous Hever Rose painting uh, which is a personal favourite of mine. And this painting has a massive question mark over it. It's really rather exciting. It's recognised by most of Anne's biographers and historians as a sort of a connection between the likenesses that we know of Anne. It's a, a, acknowledged as a very good uh, representation between that sort of quadrangle of portraits of likenesses that Ives draws our attention to. But this portrait wasn't purchased by the Guthrie family and it wasn't purchased by the Astors either. And we do have references to an ancient painting of Anne um, in a number of um, those visits that I talked about of people visiting the castle. Indeed, there's a group of artists who rent uh, Hever in the 1860s and they mention this ancient portrait of Anne. So we have no provenance for it. It has no provenance and there's every likelihood that it's been at Hever for a very long time. So that that in, its, in and of itself absolutely fascinates me. Um, of course we don't know of any contemporary portraits of Anne. Uh, every portrait that his uh, been dendrochronologized, as it were. The wood tested for its age has, has demonstrated them to be Elizabethan. And 
all of Anne fans out there are dying for a contemporary <laughs> portrait trait. So I love that question, Mark. It adds a mystery to it and an excitement. Mm-hmm. And it's just a beautiful portrait. We're, of course, also incredibly lucky to have two of Anne's books of ours, which she has both inscribed and signed. Now, you really can't get any closer to Anne than these remarkable survivals. Uh, One of our stalwart guides, Ian Smith, always says they have Anne's DNA all over them. And, you know, they're just really exciting and very intimate items of Anne's. It always makes my heart stop a bit when I have to touch them or get them out or uh, have a look at them because you really are holding something that Anne held and held very dear. So, I mean... Just just for an Anne fan, just visiting those in and of themselves is worth the trip. Um, they're beautiful objects and I'd highly recommend anyone that's interested in Anne to experience seeing them. It's really quite emotional. We also have an incredible amount of portraiture relating to Henry's court as well. And um, we just really have an amazing collection for Uh, for visitors to see. But I would argue that the best Berlin artefact is Hever itself. Um, You mentioned that those fairy tale walls, they are the walls that Anne knew. Nothing has changed. This is Anne's haven. It's her happy place. No other existing building can claim this part of Anne's early life, her formative years. And of course, that famous courtship. There's really nowhere quite like Hever and uh, where you can go and walk in those happier footsteps of Anne. Of course, you can go and visit the wonderful uh, Hampton Court uh, where her queenship played out. And, you know, the Tower of London, where one of the best days of her life uh, began the night before her coronation. And one of, you know, the most appalling events occurred to her where her life was taken. And these are fabulous, you know, incredible spaces that I would recommend anyone to go and see. But Hever is different to these places. Um, There's there's nowhere quite like it. So true. Oh, and then that, um, the portrait, that's such a, that's just got me excited thinking about it. I know. (laughs) There are actually a number of portraits that haven't been dendrochronologized, but none of them have this um, sort of uh, recognition by by historians as as being, you know, for example, uh, like the Hoskins miniature, which we believe derives from an earlier portrait, maybe even the Heaver Rose one, who knows? Um, And, you know, things like the Chequers ring. Um, so, you know, other portraits do have that question mark over them, but I'd, I'd say ours is the most exciting. <laughs> I'm still, as you know, because I think I say this every time we speak, I'm still looking for the full length portrait of oh, one that don't. once existed. Oh. oh, please, where is that? Please let it I'll... show up someday. <laughs> let it show up, exactly. All right, well, this has been so wonderful. I'm having such a good time. But let's finish with a couple of questions, questions from some listeners. So I've got here Heidi from Adventures of a Tudor Nerd would like to know what is your favourite aspect of the Berlin story? Ah, that's a cracking question. Do you know, I think my favourite part is how unbelievable it all is and how unbelievable it must have seemed to those who witnessed it. You know, if you made their story up, it it would sort of be dismissed as absurd by publishers. You know, you'd have to sack your publisher to um, (laughs) to get it published like, like Hester. Not only were the lengths that Henry went to so improbable, but Anne's downfall was completely unprecedented and unique in its decisiveness and its cruelty. I don't think anyone fell quicker nor further than Anne during Henry's tempestuous sort of reign. It's, uh, I don't know, it, there's something about it that's just so unbelievable. And it must have been quite extraordinary uh, to live through. Uh, no one could have foreseen what happened. So there must have been anxiety as well as excitement all of the time. And I just love how bold Anne is. I'm not saying she's always likeable, although I believe she's always fascinating. And she's still got us talking about her all these years later. And you know what? She would love it. She absolutely <laughs> she would, love it. She really would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so 
Yeah. yeah, that's a great answer. Now that this this last listener question, this is a, ooh, a controversial one. So Nairi okay. would like to know if there's any evidence to support the theory that Anne engaged in a sexual relationship with her own brother, or was that all just gossip? Right. So this is another great question. Thank you, Nairi. And, yeah. and one that I actually get asked a lot at Heva because of right. a certain other Berlin girl book. Yes. <laughs> and um, now, of course, it's very easy to see why you would think that and is of course accused of uh, and Georgia accused of having sexual relations and indeed uh, found guilty of doing so uh, and I would argue that the most lurid details in the indictment against Anne are in relation to this alleged act of incest. Now having said all that there really isn't anything to substantiate the allegations. Indeed I would go as far as to say that every single allegation of adultery laid against Anne was deliberately fabricated. Now, Henry wants Anne gone, and Cromwell acts upon this by utterly destroying her reputation and then destroying her body. Henry goes to extraordinary lengths to legitimise his marriage to Anne. He even has the crown of St Edward placed upon her head, uh, her coronation. This is highly unusual. It's usually reserved only for the crowning of the monarch and not the queen consort. And then he goes to extraordinary lengths to destroy that legitimacy. He cuts that head off. It's a stitch up job. I don't think there's any other uh, conclusion. So, um, yes, I would say not guilty uh, of uh, any impropriety with George. Phew, I'm name. so glad you said that. Oh, and I, I wasn't ready to get into a battle with you. <laughs> I'll throw you a curveball. I had no, a feeling no. that you were going to, to uh, you know, share the same <laughs> views as myself. Yes. <laughs> and I should add, you know, interestingly, just to add that after Anne's execution, in all the contemporary documents, she's still referred to as the late queen. She's oh, not. Yes. She's always the late queen. And I don't think from memory that that happened with Catherine Howard or no, so, no. Oh, with, definitely not with Catherine of Aragon. So, no, no, no. You know, I it's, think that's an interesting point that she was anointed. She was a queen in her own right. And there is a lot of debate there about whether she was, in fact, could she have been stripped of, of her actual title of queen? Was that even possible? You know, yeah, so that's I mean, interesting it's, it, it is fascinating. And I think one of the, well, there, there are two things that really clinch it for me. Um, there is Shapwee, just days afterwards, tells us that Cromwell says quite clearly to him, I concocted it all. I'm, um, you know, I'm not speaking his actual words, but I'm giving the essence of what he says. I made it all up. That sort of gives us, in a nutshell, what happened. Yeah. Uh, he's got no reason to lie to Shapwee about this. Indeed, he's got every reason to protect the king from that suspicion. Um, so I believe Cromwell and I believe Shapwee. And I think the other key piece of evidence is that Shapwee, who I think it's often overplayed how he feels about Anne. He, of course, uh, everything we hear about Shapwee is being sent to someone who undoubtedly dislikes her, uh, his employer. But there's a great deal of sympathy, I think, that Shapwee emits uh, during Anne's downfall. And he even uh, goes to the length of saying how, you know, uh, how how well she dies, how brave she is. I think I think most people would have known something was up. I think there's something very interesting about how short uh, it was between uh, Anne's arrest and her execution. It's incredibly unusual. If you look at the arrest, for example, of Thomas More, of Fisher, uh, of met all of the people that fall, Catherine Howard, um, they are always arrested. And then there is a long period of incarceration, sometimes up to a year and a half uh, in the case of Moore and Fisher, uh, before they are eventually executed. Anne is dead within a couple of weeks. It's extraordinary. And I think it reeks to everyone that something is up. And I think the length that they go to to blacken her name also makes people question what is going on. Uh, I, I don't think people were duped. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And that's, um, you know, I think I've mentioned to you before that I'm studying that that sort of last 18 months of her life really closely. Yes. And, and the evidence is very clear. There was you know, in terms of Cromwell, yeah. there was stuff going on very early on in, very much in, so. in the game. And, you know, it's 
it's I think we'll leave that that subject for another episode but it is <laughs> absolutely, absolutely yeah. intriguing isn't it we it could really just talk is. about it for hours <laughs> oh and it's been such an incredible pleasure I have one thing left to ask you before I let you go and get on with your day <laughs> do you have for our listeners a Berlin takeaway so something that we can explore after this episode that might help deepen our understanding of this you know truly brilliant family do you know what? Because of the current circumstances, I'm actually just going to implore your listeners to come to Heva when it reopens after this awful pandemic. Not many people know this, but Heva isn't a charity and therefore it doesn't re- receive any public funds at all to help maintain it, the cost of which is enormous. Um, so I'm sure they would really welcome your support uh, when these dark clouds have lifted. Just to emphasise again, there really isn't anywhere else like Heva if you want to get close to the blinds. Our stewards are so incredibly knowledgeable and passionate about the family. Uh, We offer private guided tours booked in advance. And we just have so much Berlin and Tudor related uh, information for you to enjoy enjoy when you come along. We also have an incredible events team. Uh, They continually amaze me with the quality of the events they put on from really immersive jousting to reenactments. And quite honestly, the most spectacular Christmas experience that you'll ever have. So, yeah, when when this horrid period is all over, please do come. And I'd love to see you there. You know, if you're an Anne fan, let's come back, come and have a chat. I'm always in the castle. And um, so, yeah, come along and let's uh, let's talk Berlin. <laughs> oh, I love it. And you know what? You've twisted my arm, Owen. I think <laughs> I think the first person you'll see lined up with the castle Come on, it's me. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for talking all things Berlin with me and for taking part in our special series. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.